Hello everyone, and welcome to the video module on exploratory sound transformations. And we have here on this first slide an image of the Phonogen, a machine that existed in different variations from the 1950s onwards, and is just one of many of thousands of different creative examples of machines for ex exploring sound transformations that have been um, put together by artists and engineers over the past um, 50 or 60 or 70 years. So before going too far into this module, maybe a, f a remark about this terminology of exploratory transformation. And so I think that this terminology of exploratory transformation is uh, really meant to distinguish corrective from exploratory transformations. And so elsewhere, including probably earlier in this course, we will have mostly explored what I might call corrective transformations of sound. Um, in other words, these are transformations where audio signals are taken and they're transformed in ways that let us hear something about those signals more clearly than we did before the transformation. For example, if we take a field recording and we use filters, equalization, to lessen the presence of some lower frequency traffic noise, perhaps that transformation lets us hear more clearly the other things that are in that audio signal. And what we're doing in this module is starting to pay attention to the possibility instead of having exploratory transformations of sound, where using sometimes extreme techniques, we take audio signals and we transform them in ways that reveal hidden aspects of the original sound or even completely new sound characters. Going back to our corrective transformation example a second ago, when we take that field recording and we attenuate using filters that traffic noise, we can hear more clearly things that were in the signal, but probably we could hear most of what was there in the signal even without the EQ or the filtering. What we're doing with that corrective transformation is just letting our audience hear that signal in a more clear way. We're focusing their attention on something they could probably hear already, but now they can hear it more clearly. When we go into the realm of exploratory transformations of sound, I think that what we're doing is taking that further, and in taking it further, we expose possibilities that are there in the sound that really are not obvious or that you, you couldn't hear necessarily in the original. Maybe you could only hear it if you had a particularly um, active imagination. In that sense, exploratory transformations of sound are, are a kind of act of the imagination mediated by audio technology. So in the remainder of this video module, we're going to talk about the, we're going to concentrate on the most common exploratory transformations. And by far and away, the most common exploratory transformation of sound that has been explored is what I call classical speed change. This has been explored since at least the 1940s, and it's been explored in numerous cultural historical locations, in, in um, experimental electronic music, in different traditions of popular music, in different places around the world. And it continues to be one of the most common exploratory transformations of sound. It just works really well. Originally, if we go back to the middle of the 20th century, it was achieved by making the playback motors of things like record players and, and wax cylinder players and tape playback machines move at different speeds. Indeed, the motors of these machines often moved at different speeds even when people didn't want them to. And so in that sense, just the routine functioning, or if you, if you will, malfunctioning of that equipment led people um, to, to notice this possibility of playing back sound signals at different speeds. When we play back sound signals at speeds other than the speed they were recorded at, there's a strict relationship that emerges 
between the speed change and the change of the frequencies, and thus also pitch and also duration. When we make the speed of playback lower, we get lower frequencies, which means we tend to also get lower pitch, and we also get longer duration. For example, if I play back uh, a record at half of its original speed, all of the frequencies will also be half of their original frequency, and it will take twice as long to get through the same um, part of that audio signal. So there's a strict relationship there that can't be changed so long as the transformation we're doing is classical speed change. And this strict relationship between speed change, frequency, and duration limits its corrective application. But it's no problem for exploratory uses, as we'll see in a second in a few examples. It might be a problem if what we're trying to do is use this technique to make little corrections to a musical performance by um, correcting the pitch of a singer or changing the rhythm of a musical performance a little bit, because those changes are always going to introduce the other changes. If we try to make a rhythm last a bit longer with classical speed change, we're always going to change its pitch as well. If we try to make a pitch a little bit higher, we're always going to make it a little bit faster as well. So as the last point there says, this limits its corrective application. It's no problem for exploratory uses. So I've got a recording here I'm going to play you. I'll play you the original first. It's a, a recording of my banjo uh, that I made in a with a really good microphone, but not in a special room or studio or anything. And then I cleaned it up a little bit with some noise reduction software. And it sounds like this. I'll play it again. And now I'm going to play an example where this original recording has been taken down an octave using classical speed change. And what we mean by down an octave is that everything, all of the pitches, all of the frequencies are half as low, or half as high, I guess you could say, as they were before. So if something was at 200 hertz, now it's at 100 hertz. If something was at 1000 hertz, now it's 500 hertz. And in tandem, with all of the frequencies coming down by half, everything takes twice as long. And that sounds like this. I'll play it again. And I think one of the things that it's always good to do when we're doing exploratory sound transformations is to take things further. So here's another example where it's been taken down two octaves instead. In other words, all of the frequencies are a quarter of what they were, and the sound takes four times as long as it did originally. It's like we're playing through the sound a quarter as fast as it was recorded. And that sounds like this. I'll cut it off. We don't have to listen to the end of the sound. Before We're going to listen to it one more time. Before we listen to it one more time, I think it's useful to call your attention that as we're transforming the sound with this classical speed change, a lot of the timbral qualities, the sonic qualities of the original recording are still there. I think we can still hear the sound of metal, of the metal banjo strings. Um, we can perhaps still hear a little bit of the quality of, um, that my fingers give to their contact with the, the banjo strings. But it also has something, it has new qualities as well. Some of the lowest pitches that you hear definitely don't sound like a banjo. They maybe sound even a little bit like a, a double bass or a bass guitar. Let's listen one more time.
they don't sound exactly like a double bass or a bass guitar though somehow there's a an extra bright metallic quality still there to it that we might relate to the banjo so the sound that we're hearing there is maybe some kind of hybrid between those other instruments and the the banjo that the instrument that the recording originally came from and so i think this is a good sign that we're doing exploratory transformations we're making some sound and we can relate it to our original recording but it also has other things in it that we're that we're discovering or that we're imagining through the technique of this transformation let's take the transformation in the other direction instead let's play the signal twice as fast all of the frequencies are going to go up and everything is going to take half as long as it used to here's everything up one octave One of the things that we can observe about the sort of broad strokes of audio culture is that it has generally been more common for people to play things slower than to play things faster in exploratory transformations. Uh, and I think the reason for that is just that as we play things slower, there's more time for the listener to pay attention to details in the sound. Sometimes when you take things up in pitch, they get this kind of chipmunky quality, especially if they're voices. I think even this banjo recording has a bit of a chipmunky quality as we take it up in take it up in pitch. But still definitely possibilities and things to discover, um, moving things both up and down in pitch. A final example of classical speed change before moving on to the next slide. Here are multiple um, classical speed changes combined into a, a little miniature musical moment. Now, all of that's based on that original banjo recording, um, but we've got different variations of it that have been put together uh, in an interesting pattern. So with classical speed change, just to go back to something we said a second ago, there are limits in how it can be used correctively because we always have the strict relationship between the speed change and the frequencies and the duration that we hear. So digital audio workstations frequently have another technique available to them, spectral time and pitch shifts. Now this technique, we should note, is only possible using digital audio technology. There is no mechanical or electrical equivalent of this. You can't do this with a tape player or a record player or a wax cylinder. And the purpose of these techniques is to be able to change the duration and to shift frequencies and pitch independently from each other. And we do this by using algorithms that are commonly found in digital audio workstations that convert the audio signal to a spectrogram, like this spectrogram I'm showing over here, a representation of the separate frequencies in the signal. And that's then stretched and shifted, and then it's all converted back to an audio signal. So, if we just pause here for a second to think about this, if you look at this spectrogram that I'm displaying over on the right here, out of context, there's no way of telling how much time this takes. It doesn't look like an audio signal, right? It's, it's, a, it's a pattern of energy in the spectrum over time. This could be 10 minutes or it could be one second. We have no way of telling. And I think that in that ambiguity, lies the possibility of algorithms like spectral time and pitch shifts. Now there's a consequence of this, which is that they typically introduce significant artifacts. And I think to unpack what we mean by artifacts in this context, we have to play a few examples. So I'm gonna go um, back to my examples. And my next example is, an, is taking the banjo recording and making it four times longer without changing the frequencies or the apparent pitch that we perceive. So this is something we couldn't do with classical speed change, but we can do it with the spectral time pitch shift technique. And let's just listen to it and then talk about it. And I'm going to stop there and I'm going to play it again and listen closely to the beginning of the sound. And I think what you will be able to hear 
is some tiny sounds that sound very artificial and don't really sound like they came from the banjo or the banjo recording. I would describe them as tiny little glides in the sound that I'm, I'm pretty sure don't have too much to do with the original recording. Let's take another version of the spectral shift. This time it's been, the original recording has been stretched to be 20 times longer with no frequency change. And I think in this one, these artifacts are gonna be more apparent. So the artifacts are, are mostly apparent around the moments when the banjo strings are plucked, but we might hear artifacts with different algorithms in different places. Um, the, algor the artifacts that I hear with this transformation, I would describe as a slightly warbly sensation and the sensation of some little pitch glides that are in there, um, none of which are really qualities of the original sound. They're qualities that have been introduced by this algorithm and probably if we transformed lots of sounds, we would hear those similar qualities being introduced. Um, and so that leads to a definition of artifacts. Our, our working definition of artifacts when dealing with transformation of audio signals will be that they're components that are added to a signal that are more closely related to the algorithm of transformation than to the sound signal being transformed. Spectral time and pitch shifts, like the one we just saw, often introduce such artifacts but they can also come from noise reduction algorithms, data compression, sample rate conversion, and other transformations. They're not always a terrible thing, um, but I think they can be limiting in, in the sense that the, a given algorithm will often introduce the same artifacts to everything it touches. And so that can be kind of limiting or, a little, or perhaps a little bit boring. It's nice to hold on to the uniqueness and the variety of our original recordings, even as we transform them even as we transform them in exploratory ways. So we get to a third technique, and it's the last one we're gonna look at in detail for this video, the technique of granular synthesis, which has also commonly been used for time and pitch stretching of material. And the basic idea with granular synthesis is that we slowly move through the original audio signal, copying short excerpts from it, which we call grains. And those grains might be anywhere from five to 100 or so milliseconds in duration. It's not an exact science. And we take many of those little grains and we overlap them in different ways in the output. Moreover, each of those tiny little grains, and we're piling up many, many thousands of them over time, can be independently transformed with an envelope, fade in and fade out. We can pan them to different speakers. We can apply classical speed change to get different shifts of frequency. We can also apply other transformations to them. So it's a very flexible technique. It's a subset of a larger field of exploration that's sometimes known as microsound, which is where we work with short segments of larger sound signals in detailed and creative ways. So I have some examples of this to share with you. Um, here's example number seven. This is the same banjo recording and it's been stretched the first 40% of it has been stretched to be 90 seconds long. So this is really a comparable level of stretch to what we heard, I think, in the, in the last spectral shift example. And it will definitely sound artificial, but in different ways. And so one of the things we can listen for is how are the artifacts different with this granular synthesis technique? So here goes.
I'll stop it there. And I'm going to play a second example um, of the same technique, but now it's being used m in multiple instances. We're hearing the same granular synthesis parameters being used, but with different levels of frequency transformation being applied to all the grains. And that's going to sound like this. I'm going to stop it there. So uh, you can, of course, rewind if you want to hear some more, appreciate more of those details your, yourself. I think that you can appreciate that we're we're getting a really rich texture from this granular synthesis transformation of the original banjo recording. Let's jump back to the original recording. So we found quite a lot of variety already just using these three techniques. There are certainly many other exploratory transformations um, we could look at or learn about. Concatenative synthesis kind of takes the idea of granular synthesis further. What if we were making new sounds by piling up little grains taken out of our source sounds, but we were picking those grains in other ways than just moving through the sound? What if we picked them by their similarity to a particular sound that we wanted to match, for example. That would be one example of concatenative synthesis. Subtractive synthesis is something that we've talked about already when we were talking about synthesis more generally. It's the idea of taking something like a noise source that has lots of energy in it throughout the spectrum and then use, using filters to um, cut away and to carve away the spectrum and just have the energy in one part of the spectrum. If we do that in extreme ways, that could definitely be an exploratory transformation. If we take a filter that's really narrowly tuned to a particular frequency and then put a recording through it, we'll hear only the part of that recording that makes that, that filter frequency ring and we'll get some interesting new sounds from that. More generally, extreme uses of distortion and filters um, could become exploratory transformations. I think that perhaps in an earlier part of this course when we explored filters in particular, we probably were fairly gentle with the filter parameters we used, trying not to quote unquote damage the audio. But if we're going at this with the intent of, of making exploratory transformations of sound, I don't think we need to be so careful anymore. We might be interested to find extreme parameters that produce new and interesting results. Cross convolution of signals is another possibility that is ready at hand in our reverb module. We talked about convolution reverbs, and we saw that convolution reverbs require an impulse response. Usually those impulse responses are recorded from a, a spark plug or a balloon popping uh, or some other sharp sound in a room. But actually, we can use any audio signal as our impulse response in a convolution reverb. And when we do that, we get something that is a complex combination of both signals. We can see that as a kind of exploratory transformation. And there are many, many, many more of these things. I think one general way of finding exploratory transformations is taking things that are at hand and turning them up to 11, so to speak. Uh, just exploring the parameter space and uh, with, with your own recordings and finding new and interesting things that emerge. So to summarize what we talked about today, we talked about the general distinction between corrective and exploratory transformations of sound. We looked at the very important and very tried and true transformation, classical speech change. 
which has the characteristic that duration and speed and frequency change are tied to each other in a strict way. We looked also at spectral and time pitch shifts, spectral time and pitch shifts, which uh, enable duration and speed and frequency to be independent, but at the cost of potentially introducing significant artifacts. We looked at granular synthesis, which has lots of different possibilities and often introduces pleasant artifacts. And we pointed to the fact that there are many, many other exploratory transformations to explore. So thank you for listening and talk to you soon.